All right. Well, good morning, church. Man, who's excited about being in church today? Man, what a beautiful day. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So, hey, uh, first of all, I just want to say, I don't know what the series has been for you, but I know that this series has been a real blessing for me. I don't know if you agree with that. If you don't, okay, it's fine. Um, but what's been really cool uh, for me is I've been working my way through just the different passages and uh, the different concepts in this series is I've been really blessed by it. I've grown a lot. The Lord's helped me to become a better spouse, a better husband. Um, and I hope that's been the case for you. I know that many of you um, have reached out to me. I've gotten a lot of emails and messages from different people in the congregation and um, emails. It hasn't just been like general feedback either, right? Usually pastors get general feedback, which is, hey, man, great sermon, bro. That was great. You know, usually it's general like that. But what's been really cool about this series in particular is that there's been very specific feedback that people have given me about how God has grown them. Um, in their season of life. And here's what's really cool. It hasn't just been married people that have been emailing me. Uh, It's been uh, single people. It's been people who are dating. It's been people who are engaged. It's been people who are divorced. It's been people who are widowed. It's been people from all seasons of life. And so it's been a huge blessing to receive that that, that feedback, not because necessarily I need it, but it's because uh, it's been my prayer. My prayer going into this series was just that, that this would be a series that would encourage and equip not just people who are married, but people in any stage of life. And so all glory to God for that. Um, This morning, we are in the fourth and final part of our series entitled The Gospel-Centered Marriage. And for those of you who have been following along with us, you know that we have defined a gospel-centered marriage this way. A gospel-centered marriage is one that models the gospel through continual gospel meditation and gospel motivation. Another way that we've been saying it is this, gospel meditation plus gospel motivation equals the gospel model, okay? So now, as we conclude the series today, the, the passage that we are going to be looking at comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you have your uh, devices, turn those on. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, Okay? What we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at this passage under two headings. Uh, We are going to look at the role of the wife, and then after we look at that, we are going to look at the role of the husband. So this morning, we're going to begin by looking at the role of the wife. Look what it says in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Let's go ahead and say that part together. Ready? Which in God's sight is very precious. Not that it necessarily matters. It's just I want to make sure you're with me. Okay, that's a random part of the verse. But anyways, verse 5. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, and if you do good and do not fear that anything that is frightening. It's the word of the Lord. So we're starting this message by looking at the role of the wife, the role of the wife. And when you look at this passage, what we see is that there are three things or three parts to this role that a woman is to play. Now, If you noticed at the beginning of the verse, he brought up the idea of submission again, which is what we talked about last week. So this week, I'm not really going to get into the whole submission thing. We already talked about that. So if you want to know what I mean by that, or if you're getting offended by that, uh, hold your offense, uh, go back and listen to that message and then come back and then re-listen to this one, okay? So we're not going to get into that again, but he brings up the idea of submission again. And then essentially what he says is that there are three things that a woman needs to know in order to be a godly wife. There are three areas 
Behavior, beauty, and belief. Behavior, beauty, and belief. And here's what's great. Even if you're sitting here this morning and you're not a wife yet, or maybe God might not ever call you to be a wife, these three things are areas in which, these are three areas when you can grow as well. You don't have to be a wife to grow in these areas. But it's behavior, it's beauty, and it's belief. So let's look at the first one. The first mark of a godly wife is behavior. I'm going to reread verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So, the first mark of a godly wife is their behavior. So, so Peter here is getting after behavior. Now, here's what's really important, and this is the thing that I want to make sure you see. In this section, Peter is specifically speaking to women who are married to men that are not Christians. In other words, he is speaking to unequally yoked marriages. But here's the thing. The reality is when you look at what he actually writes, these are things that any person can learn from. And I would argue that if you are a Christian who is trying to reach a non-Christian, what Peter says here is necessary for any person trying to reach any person with the gospel, okay? But specifically here, he is speaking to women who are married to a non-Christian man. He talks about, if you go back to the verse, there's a few words that I want to highlight there. If you go back to the verse, there's a few words. Okay, great. So it says, likewise, be subject to your old husbands, even if some do not obey the word. And then in, in verse 2, it says, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 2 says, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Now, the word there, respectful, it means to have reverence, to have worship, to have awe. So it's not talking necessarily respectful necessarily to them, but it's a, a worshipful reverence to God. That's what the word there, respectful, means. And then the word there, pure, it means holy, it means blameless, it means without blemish. So he's talking specifically to women who are married to non-Christian men, and he says, listen, you need to focus more on your actions than on your arguments. You need to focus more on your conduct than on your content. In other words, Peter says, a, a behaving wife is better than a badgering wife. So if, if you're a wife that leaves gospel tracts under your husband's pillows, or, or you preset their, their Christian radio station in their car so when it turns on, they're listening to some sort of Christian radio station, or, or at dinner, you're praying awkwardly for their salvation in front of the kids, or you manipulate them some way or somehow to get them to church, he's saying that a better way is actually to live out your faith. And that as you live out your faith, they will see. It says when they see. The, the word there, see, is actually interesting because it, it's not just to casually glance at something. The word there, see, it means to scrutinize. It means to carefully observe. In other words, he's saying that a, a husband, a non-Christian husband, is watching their Christian wife. He is carefully scrutinizing. But, but, but if you notice, though, the word see doesn't have to do with what he hears. It has to do with what he sees. So it has to do with your actions, not your arguments. It has to do with your actions, not your apologetics. Now, here's the thing. What, what Peter's not saying is that at some point you don't share your faith. At some point, you need to share but he's saying that the primary, most effective way to impact that unsaving spouse, and this is true even if you're a man married to a non-Christian woman, is to live it out. Is to live it out. One of the people that I didn't know actually this week until I was, I didn't know about this until this week when I was reading it was uh, St. Augustine, the, the famous church father. Uh, in his book, Confessions, he actually writes about the relationship between his mom and his dad. And his mom was a believer, and his dad was an unbeliever. And look what he says. He says, she served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you. Talking about God. Speaking to him of you by her conduct, 
by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. So St. Augustine is talking about his mom and dad and how his mom essentially lived out 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and that at the end of his father's life, his father became a believer. And so if you're sitting here today, one of the things I promised at the beginning of the series, week one, I was talking to singles about not being unequally yoked, and I said I was going to come back and talk to people who were married already, and that could be because you married the person knowing they were non-believers, or maybe you both went into the marriage as unbelievers and you got saved after. I need you to know that there is hope and that God can actually use you to bring your spouse to a saving knowledge of him. Here's the thing. This is a real quick side note for the people here who are single. If you're sitting here and you're single, this section is not a challenge to be taken. It is a warning to be heeded. Don't miss that. Because some, some single people are sitting here and because you want to justify sin, you're like, oh, well, I, that means I can keep dating the person I'm dating then. Because even if they don't get saved now, I'll get them saved later. Well, there's a couple problems with that. One, you're not the person who gets them saved. But two, you, you, you're using this, what should be a passage that gives hope, you're using it as an excuse. That's why every time I'm with a non-Christian or with a Christian, right, a girl or a guy, and they come up to me and they, they make it seem so complicated. They're like, well, you know, Will, I just, I need some wisdom, man. I've been, I've been dating this non-Christian now for two years and four years, six years, and man, they're just, they're just so great, you know? And we just have so much, so, so much in common and we love each other. And I just, you know, what, what do I do? You know, what, what should I do? And I'm like, man, this is easy. I don't know, I don't know why you're making it so hard. I don't care how long you've been with them. If they don't know Jesus, don't marry them. That's it. Let's not make something complicated when it's not. So remember, this is, a, this is not, a, this is a, this is not a, a challenge to be taken. It's a warning to be heeded. Don't confuse God giving hope for God giving you an excuse. So the first thing is behavior. The second mark of a godly wife, according to this passage, is beauty. Beauty. Look what it says in verse 3. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. Let's say that together. Ready? The hidden person of the heart. Let's try one more time. The hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, before you walk out or, or throw something at me or boo me, you have options, um, before you do any of that, and if you get up, I'm going to just assume the best and assume you have to go to the bathroom, okay? I'm not going to take it personal. He says that the second mark of a godly wife is their beauty, is their beauty. But before I tell you what it is, let me tell you what it's not. This isn't some legalistic ban on fashion, or on makeup. He isn't saying what many preachers say about this. He isn't saying that modest is hottest, okay? That, that's not what he's saying here. I am a firm believer that if the barn needs painting, paint it, okay? <laughs> Amen, brother. And start painting it up. Okay, so he doesn't mean that then. What, what, what he means is, get this, he's not saying there's anything wrong with makeup, he's not saying there's anything wrong with jewelry, he's not saying anything wrong with, with fashion. What he's saying is, is that your primary hope and security should not come from your external appearance. It should come from your internal beauty. Does that make sense? What are you focusing on? Now, here's the thing. Some of you, women here in the house, married or non-married, you might be sitting here saying amen right now. But, but here's the thing. 
Here's what you understand. I, I, I want to ask you some questions here to, to help you diagnose this situation in your life. Before you agree with me, here are some questions. The first question is this. What is your definition of beauty? Like, seriously, think about that for a second. One, do you have one? And if you have one, what is it really? Because your definition will determine what you pursue. What is your actual definition of beauty? Here's another question. Do you spend more time in front of a physical mirror or the spiritual mirror of God's word? Is it even comparable? Do you spend more time grooming the outer person or growing the inner person? Are you, do you, is, are you one of those people that you never miss gym time, but you often miss quiet time? Maybe what your soul needs is not a spa day, but a spiritual day. And quickly, for men here, you need to understand that when you are choosing a spouse, you have to make sure that you are choosing a spouse that is more beautiful on the inside than she is on the outside. Because as one pastor put it, here's what happens if you don't. If you don't, then you're going to have a beautiful wedding and an ugly marriage. You're going to have a great honeymoon and miserable anniversaries. Make a decision based on beauty that is unfading and imperishable. Because if you make a decision based on beauty that is fading and perishable, then you're literally investing in a depreciating asset. It will only go down over time. Okay? So that's what it's not. So what is it then? If, if that's what it's not, then what type of beauty are we to pursue? What type of beauty are, does, does, God, does Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, want women to display? Well, he describes it with two words. If you go back to the passage, he describes the type of beauty that, that women need to display as gentle and quiet. Now, again, before you walk out, let me explain what I mean. The word gentle is actually a fruit of the Spirit. So it's not just for, Christ, for women, it is for Christians. But he says, a gentle and quiet spirit is what is truly beautiful and precious in the eyes of God. So let's unpack these two words, because I think that understanding these words will give you an idea of what is actually being asked here. So gentle there, it means someone who is not selfish or self-assertive. It, the way that one uh, person put it that I think was super helpful is to be gentle means to have power under control. So to be gentle means, doesn't mean you don't have power. It means that you have power that is under control. That's what the word gentle means. And then the word quiet, it means peaceful. It means to be calm. It literally means to be undisturbed. And in the Greek there, the, the mental picture is of a lake at the beginning of a mor an early morning that hasn't been disturbed at all. It's just sitting there undisturbed. So, so the word there, the words gentle and quiet can seem very old school and traditional, like, hey, get, go, go in the kitchen and don't talk. That's not what he's saying. If the word gentle there means to have power under control. It means not to be selfish or self-assertive. And the word peace there means, uh, the word quiet there means to be peaceful, to be undisturbed. Then, then essentially what he's saying is that true beauty looks different than what the world says beauty is. He says that is what is precious in God's eyes. But, but, but don't miss this, and I'm going to unpack this later on, but I want to make sure I, I make this clear here. The reason why you can be gentle and be quiet is because you are precious in God's eyes. Don't miss that. So he's not saying if you're gentle and you're quiet, then you'll be precious. He's saying that because you are precious, you can be gentle and you can be quiet. Does that make sense? 
Don't miss the order there. Because what you can do is legalistically assume, oh, I got I to gotta be gentle and quiet if I'm going to be precious in God's eyes. No, 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 that's not the gospel. That's religion. It's because God sees me, because God affirms me, because God has secured me, I can have power under control. I don't constantly have to be asserting myself. I can be at peace both externally and internally. But the question, women, you have to ask yourself is this. Would the people in your life describe you as quiet or as gentle? Again, I'm not talking about words here. Remember the definitions I'm using. Would the people in your life describe you using these words? As you think about the tone that you set at your house every morning, as you set the tone for your house, is it a quiet, peaceful, gentle tone, atmosphere? Or is it anger? Is it aggressiveness? Is it selfishness? Is it moodiness? What type of beauty are you displaying? And here's a better question, especially if you have girls. What type of beauty are you telling your children is the most important type of beauty? Do they see mom in front of the mirror more than they see mom in front of the word? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Because I would argue... And I'm already being controversial, so I might as well keep it going. I would argue that when, Christ, when, 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 when teenagers go to college and they walk away from the Lord, I would argue that really they left a long time ago because they were seeing it at home. True beauty, church attendance, whatever it is, all those things that matter were already displayed. Soccer practice is more important than, than church, honey. Your tournament is more important than Sunday. So worldliness was already being displayed. They were already learning it way before college started. That's what you see. Proverbs 31 verse 30 says this. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but the woman who fears the Lord will be praised. He's not saying that charm and beauty is, are, are, are horrible things. He's saying they're deceitful in their passing, but it's the woman who fears the Lord who will be praised. That essentially summarizes everything Peter says in that section. The last thing we see is this. A godly wife is characterized by her behavior, by her beauty, and the last thing is her belief. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God, everyone say hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, I'm not going to have you call your husband Lord, I promise. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I'm fascinated by that last part. I'm looking forward to get to it in a second. Do not fear anything. He could stop there. That he says, that is frightening. Okay? So we'll get, we'll get to that in a second. Here's what I need you to know. The only way that you as a godly wife will be able to have a godly behavior and a godly beauty is if you have a godly belief. Even though the belief comes third, it actually comes first. What you believe will determine how you behave and how you perceive beauty. What you believe. Well, how do we know that? Well, because it says, if you go back to the passage in verse 5, it says that for this reason, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God. The word hope there has to do with what they believed. In other words, the reason why Sarah was able to behave the way she behaved with Abraham, it wasn't because Abraham was a good leader. If you look at the Bible, Abraham was a terrible leader. Her hope wasn't in Abraham. It was in God. And so the reason why she was able to behave the way she behaved was because her hope was not in her earthly spouse. It was in her heavenly spouse. Don't miss that. So, So your belief 
precedes your behavior and your beauty. If, if you, in other words, if you go out and try to behave and, and, and pursue this beauty, apart from the right belief, you're not going to be able to do it because it's the belief that becomes the catalyst for the behavior and for the beauty. Does that make sense? The word there, hope, though, is really important, though. They hoped in God. And the reason why I love that word hope so much is because it actually, it's, it's much stronger than what a lot of us think when we think of hope. You know, when, when we think of hope, almost always what, what we think is we think, man, it's like wishful thinking. Man, hopefully. Hey, hey the, the economy is going to get better. Hopefully. Hey, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to that thing. Well, hopefully. I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Hope so. Right? And the problem is, is that we have hijacked the word hope. In, in, in Scripture, in, in the Greek, the word hope there means a future expectation. An expectation. And then it also means to have full confidence. Not partial, partial confidence. The word hope means to have full confidence. So when it says that they placed their hope in God, it wasn't our definition of hope. It was the biblical definition of hope. This is a strong biblical hope that these women were displaying. But remember, the only way, the only way that you will ever be able to overcome fear, that's why I really pause on that last part. He talked about not being of, afraid, right, of what is frightening. In other words, Peter isn't saying that there isn't things to be scared of. Being a wife that submits to her husband in this day, there's a lot of fear that comes with that. There's a lot of fear involved. There are things that should frighten you. But Peter says that the way you overcome that is not by saying there isn't any fear, but by overpowering that fear with hope. In other words, to deal with your anxiety, what you need is not an absence of fear. What you need is the presence of hope. You hear that? The way you deal with your anxiety... It's not the absence of fear, because fear is always going to be something to fear. It's in the presence of hope. The only way to become fearless is to become hopeful. You can't be filled with hope and with fear at the same time. The more you are filled with hope, the less you will be filled with, filled with fear. Okay? One of, the, one of the movies, and you guys are probably going to make fun of me, but one of the movies that I really like, I don't like the books, uh, but I like the movie, uh, is the Hunger Game books and, 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 or movies. And the reason why I don't like the books is not because they're written bad per se, but because most of the book is her having just internal dialogue. And uh, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, so I've had enough uh, teenage girls having internal dialogue. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to do is go read about it, okay? But in the movie, it's great. And uh, here's what President Snow says at some point. that he, want, he doesn't want the people to rebel. And here's a quote. This is interesting because it actually summarizes what Peter is saying. He says, hope, it's the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. That's what the enemy says. The enemy knows that. The enemy knows that the only thing stronger than your fear is hope. He says that a little hope might be effective, but a lot of fear to the enemy is dangerous. So it's not the absence of fear, it's the presence of hope that will help you overcome and will help you become the wife that you are being called to be. Guys, here's the thing. Let me, let me speak. I've been speaking directly to women, but let me really, really speak to women here for a second, okay? True beauty is not found in how you look, it is found in your Lord. True beauty is not found in your cosmetics, it's found in your creator. True beauty is not found in your earthly spouse, it's found in your heavenly spouse. True beauty is not found in your outer person, it's found in your inner position. There is a lot to be afraid of. Hear me say that. There is a lot to be afraid of, but guess what? God is greater than your fear. 
God is greater than your concerns. God is greater than your divorce. God is greater than your past. God is greater than your spouse. There's a lot to be afraid of, but God is greater than whatever you're afraid of. God is a problem for your problem. Listen, there, there are women here, and everyone's different, right? So, so you, you might be in a different situation. You might have a different spouse. You might have different struggles. You might be in a different season. But guess what? Your Savior is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know, one of, the, one of the things that really stands out to me in this text is that, like I said earlier, it almost seems like you have to be beautiful in order for God to find you beautiful. But that's how a religious person would preach this passage. In other words, God doesn't, it is not, it's not that God found you beautiful and then he loved you. It's, no, he loved you in order to make you beautiful. It's not that God found you lovely and then made you lovely. No, no, it's that he, he loved you in order to make you lovely. It's not that he saw you as pretty and then made you, no, no, it's that he... He, he loved you in order to make you pretty. When you, when you mess up the order, it becomes about you and not about him. This passage is not ultimately about wives. It's about the ultimate spouse, which is Jesus loving you at the cross. And when you flip it, you make it about you and not about him. You know, one of my favorite stories um, that, that, that uh, I've heard or illustrations, if you will, comes from Pastor Matt Chandler. And Pastor Matt Chandler is a pastor in Texas, and he said that he was at this conference once. And uh, at the conference, it was a youth conference, and there was this old school uh, religious Helen Brimstone pastor preaching. And he started a sermon by passing out a rose. And he, the rose started on one side of the room, and as he was preaching, he asked people to pass the rose along. Keep passing the rose along. Keep passing the rose along. And the whole sermon was about purity and about being beautiful in God's eyes. And at the end of the sermon, he asked for the rose back, and they give him the rose, and the rose is just battered because it's been passed around through all these teenagers. And the guy gets up, and he goes, you know, look at this rose. How can God ever love a rose this ugly? How can God ever love a rose this hideous? Look at this. This is why you got to pursue purity, and this is why you got to be beautiful, and this is why you got to adorn yourself because if you don't, how can God ever love a rose like this? Here's what I need you to know, guys. According to the gospel, Jesus wants that rose. Jesus loves the rose. And so regardless of who you are and regardless of where you've been, Jesus loves the rose. That's why the way one pastor put it that I think was really helpful is if you flip this, if you read this passage for women in reverse, it actually tells you what Peter says. It wants you to know. He says, essentially, when you read it in reverse, he says, do not fear. Instead, put your hope in God. And as you put your hope in God, it will manifest itself with godly behavior and godly beauty. So when you look at it in reverse, you see the gospel being what motivates you to be the wife that God is calling you to be. The only way you're ever, last thing the wives, the only way you're ever going to live up to the standards of this passage is not through guilty fear, but through gospel freedom. Amen? The next thing I want to look at is the role of the husband. Look what it says in verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I know what women are thinking. You're thinking, how do I get six verses? (laughs) And this brother gets one verse. (laughs) Here's why. The reason why... Peter t- spends more time writing to women than to men. It's not because he thought women had more problems, but it's because in those days, there was not a lot written about women. There was, a not, there was not a lot written to women because in those days, women had no rights. They couldn't own property. They couldn't testify in court. They were seen as less than. 
So in other words, in those days, when, when a husband, a woman would always just believe whatever the husband believed. So if he was a pagan, you were a pagan. If he was a Christian, you were a Christian. Whatever religion he believed, you had to believe. But the reason why Peter takes more time speaking to the woman was because a woman in those, being a woman in those days, a Christian woman was way harder to navigate than being a man in those days. So it's not because women are worse, but it's because it was harder for a woman to navigate the culture that they were in. Does that make sense? So there's two things that a husband has to have in order to be a godly husband. A husband has to be thoughtful, and a husband has to be respectful. Let's, let's begin with the first one. The first thing that a husband has to have is a husband has to be thoughtful. Look what it says in the first half of verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. There's a few words I want you to see there that unpack this idea of being thoughtful. The first word is the word there, live. The word there, live, it means to live in proximity to someone. But it doesn't just have the idea of proximity. It has the idea of intimacy. We talked, this, we talked about this a little bit when we looked at the elder brother. There's a difference between proximity and intimacy. The word there, live, it carries the connotations of being living with someone, but not just being near to them in proximity, but actually being close to them in intimacy, Right? It means to reside with someone. It means to do life with someone. Then the other word I want you to see that is really important, which is where I get the idea of being thoughtful, is the word understanding. The word understanding there, it means to have a deep knowledge of something. It means to be acquainted with something. It means to be fully aware of and comprehending something. So what he's saying is that Husbands are to be thoughtful. In other words, what Peter is arguing is that being a good husband doesn't happen by accident. Being a good husband takes a lot of work and a lot of intentionality and a lot of consideration. You must be thoughtful. So, so what does that mean? What, 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 what does that mean to, to be thoughtful? There's a few things I want to say about that. The first thing I need you to know is that we are, this is something that we are to obey, man. Here's why. Because in the text, it is written as a command. It's not a suggestion. So Paul's not saying, hey, if you get to it, husbands, you should live with your wife in an understanding way. No, no. It is a command. It's not a suggestion. It is a command. This isn't optional. It is obedience. So when you don't do it, let me make this crystal clear. When you don't do this, not only are you sinning against your wife, you are sinning against God. Because it is a command. Okay? Something that we must obey. But the other thing that this means is that we must observe. We must be people who ob observe. And, and here's what I mean. Essentially what he is saying here is that we as husbands have to be lifelong students of our wives. We must be constantly asking questions, doing research, downloading software updates. You know how you need a software update on your phone? You need software updates with your wife. The app needs updating. Why? Because your wife changes. The woman you married 20 years ago is different from the woman that you're married to today. And one of the things that men do is, man, honey, I know you so well. And then you ask them some, some evidence and they bring up something that you brought up when you were dating. Remember how you really like fries? So, so you have to constantly be studying, constantly be learning, constantly be growing because your wife changes. The, the way I would put it is if my wife's name Lily, I, my wife's name Lily, I would say that I have to be a Lilyologist. Part of my job is to be a Lilyologist. I need to know my wife better than anyone else. And part of knowing them we talked about this last week, is loving them the way they perceive love, not the way we perceive love. Remember that? So knowing their love language is important. Knowing how they receive love is important. I know some of you maybe aren't as big of fans on the Enneagram, but knowing what number they are is important because there are certain things that your wife needs as that number that you must be aware of. So whatever test you use, use something because you need help. <laughs> Amen. Amen, right? Get to know the wife that you are married to. Not someone else's wife. Your wife. Okay? That's what it means there to be thoughtful, to be constantly 
studying. One of the things that's great about being thoughtful is that when you are thoughtful, it actually helps you a lot in your marriage. Because the word there, uh, the, the word there to have understanding, it doesn't just have to do horizontally with your wife. It actually has to do spiritually with God. That, so to lead with an understanding way means that you are aware of who you're married to, but you're also aware of who, you, of who you're married to. It's, it's both and. It's spiritual and it's uh, relational. It's vertical and it's horizontal. Here's why it's important to understand your wife. Because the way I heard it put is this way. Men are the thermostats of a marriage. Women are the thermometers of a marriage. So here's what I mean. The person who sets the spiritual tone and temperature in a marriage is the husband. The person who God's going to ask about and hold accountable to is, is the man. What spiritual temperature did you set your household at? But women, they're not the thermostats, but they are great thermometers. A wife will let you know what your temperature is. Not the temperature you think it is, but the temperature it actually is. Okay? Here's another thing that's really important about that idea of being thoughtful. That when done correctly, when you are considering your wife, when you are studying your wife, when you are becoming acquainted with your wife, it keeps you from being back to back. And here's what I mean. I came across this concept in a book uh, maybe about a month ago as I was preparing for this series. He says that there are three types of marriages. There are the face-to-face -face marriages, there are the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder marriages, and there's the back-to-back -back marriages. He says that most of our time, if we're going to be a healthy marriage, should be face-to-face. -face. Now, there's going to be times where you're shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder and you're working on something like parenting, career, whatever, right? But he says what happens is you begin marriage with being face-to-face, -face, and then children show up, and life happens, and then all you do is do life shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. The problem is that if you do shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder long enough and you don't go back to face-to-face, when the kids leave, you're back to back. When you have nothing else to work together for, then you have nothing else in common and you've gone from face to face to shoulder to shoulder to back to back. Some of you may be right there right now. Your kids have left and you thought this was going to be the best time of your marriage and it's the loneliest time. Because you spent so much time shoulder to shoulder instead of face to face that now you've ended up back to back. Being thoughtful, being considerate, keeps you face-to-face -face regardless of what season your marriage is in. That's what it means. And that's why it is so important. The next thing I want you to see is that a godly husband isn't just thoughtful, he is respectful. Look what it says. Verse 7. Likewise... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor, that's where I get the word respect, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And then let me continue reading it. Um, I'll go to the next part. It says, since they, they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. But it says that we are to honor them as the weaker vessel. The word there, honor, it means to pay respects to someone. It means to ascribe worth to someone. It means to see something as precious and as valuable. So the word there, honor, means. This is where I get the word respect from, to be respectful. And the word weaker vessel, here's what it means. All it means is that women usually, not always, but women usually are weaker physically than men. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that women are weaker spiritually or emotionally or relationally or morally or spiritually. All it means is that by and large, if there's an arm wrestling contest, the man's going to win. That's all it means. Okay? He says that we are to honor the woman. What does it mean to honor? Well, there's a few aspects to it that I want to unpack. The first thing that it means to honor is that there's a daily component. Here's what I mean. The way you honor your wife, the way you respect your wife is by making sure that you are honoring her with your words, with your time, and with your money. Okay? So with your words. So, so for example, here's the question I want to ask you husbands. How do you speak about your wife? Publicly, privately. When you're with your friends, when you're at work, 
How do you speak about your wife? That's one of the ways you honor her. Another way is, how do you speak to your wife? Man, there's some guys who are super respectful to everybody else. And they get to the person that they're supposed to honor the most, and they, they, they treat them like they're garbage. How do you speak to your wife publicly and privately? Well, maybe publicly, you're a gentleman. But if privately, you're, you're swearing at her and, and, and cussing at her and yelling at her and belittling her. You know, one of the things it says in Colossians, I've never looked at this passage before, but I came across it this week. In Colossians 3, it says, husbands, do not be harsh with your wives. And here's what that word means. I looked that up in the Greek. To, to be harsh, it means that you treat them in such a way that they become bitter to taste in, in, in the, to the taste and sharp to the touch. That you treat someone so poorly that over time they become bitter and sharp. That's your fault because you're being harsh with them. They are acting the way you treat them. That's really important. Do you honor your wife with your words? Do you honor your wife with your time? Do you honor your wife with your money? Does it reflect, does your, do, do your resources reflect a sacrificial honor to the woman that God has given you, okay? So it means there's a daily component to that. But you know what? There's also a sexual component to it. And here's what I mean. One of the reasons why Peter, commentators say, one of the reasons why Peter brings up the idea of weaker vessel is because a man should never, under any circumstances, overpower a woman physically. Ever. Oh, well, I'm her husband, so she has to have sex with me. Well, no. Ever. Should a man overpower a woman? Use his authority to overpower her. That's not marriage. That's abuse. So, 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 so there's a sexual component to it, too. One of, one of the things that this means, though, is that your wife should always be your standard of beauty. Always. So, so if your wife happens to be 22... And blonde, then guess what? You are into 22-year-old blonde girls. If your wife happens to be 63, uh, gray-haired and chubby, then guess what? You're in the 63-year-old, gray-haired, chubby girls. Because your standard of beauty, physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, is your wife. So, so if, you, if the reason why you don't want to be in your marriage anymore is because she just doesn't, she doesn't have the person, I connect more with this girl over here. Well, well, sorry, but your standard is your wife. That's what he's saying here. That's who your standard is. There, there was a, 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 a study done by the website Hello Cupid, and here's what they discovered. They, they, asked this, they did this national poll, and they discovered that women, as they get older, the men that they are attracted to also get older in their minds. So, so if a woman's 40, they are attracted to 40-year-old men. If a woman is 50, they are attracted to 50-year-old men. Men, on the other hand, whether they're 30, 40, 50, or 60, they're only attracted to 20-year-old women. What we see, though, in the passage is that that's not biblical because your standard of beauty must always be nothing more and nothing less than the wife that God has given you. Amen. Single men, if you're sitting here today and you are single, you have yet to be married, I want, you, I want to ask you a question. Do you and God have the same interest in women? Are you interested in the same type of women that God's interested in? In other words, is your standard of beauty, is, is, is what you consider important the same things that God considers important? If the reason, if, if, if you don't, here's maybe why. Because if all you do is watch porn, then guess what you're gonna be attracted to? Porn stars. That's how it works. So your standard of beauty is this make-believe person that doesn't exist. And so maybe the reason why you and God aren't attracted to the same things is because you're not looking at the same things.
You got to ask yourself, am I pursuing a godly wife or a pretty girlfriend? You have to make sure that what God is attracted to is what you're attracted to. It says in Samuel that God looks not at the outward appearance, but at the what? At the heart. So what you should be praying through and asking God to reveal to you is, Lord, help me to be attracted to the things that you're attracted to. An unfading beauty. Not an external fading beauty, but an unfading internal, imperishable beauty beauty. So that's what it means to be a godly husband. You must be thoughtful. You must be respectful. Now, here's the thing. Man, I don't know about you, but one of the things that happened to me this week as I was prepping and, and you know, preparing is that there's another aspect to this, that there's a, there's a spiritual component to being respectful. Here's why. It says that for the man who doesn't do those things, his prayers will be hindered. Now, that's, that's funny, right? Because it's like, what, what does that mean? And why is God getting into my spiritual life if there's problems in my marital life? Well, what's the connection between the two? Well, think about it. Let me put it to you like this. If I am in a fight with my wife, or I'm being disrespectful with my wife, the last person I'm going to call to talk to about it is my father-in-law. Hey, man. So I'm treating your daughter like crap. <laughs> you want to talk about it? It says in the passage that women are heirs with you of the grace of life. So that means that they are your sister before they are your spouse. So what that means is they are his daughter before they are your spouse. So when you are interacting with the spouse that God has given you, you better understand that that is his daughter. And one day he's going to hold you accountable for how you treated his daughter. And so the reason why your prayers are hindered, and the word they're hindered is, super, is really interesting. It means to... to intentionally impose or impede on someone's progress. So it means that you had a, a direct line to God and all of a sudden the, the wires are crossed and the connection's broken. Why? Because when, when you're messing with the daughter, the last person you want to talk to is the father. And to be honest, let's be honest, it's not just that God won't listen as much, but it's that you don't even pray as hard when you know there's something wrong with your wife. You don't, you don't ask for big things because you know there's an issue in the house. So your prayers are hindered on your end, not just on God's end. Because you're not praying as boldly because you know you've been a poor husband. But here's the thing. As I look at this passage, one of the things that, uh, and, and on the one hand, kind of made me feel bad, but then at the, at the other hand, encouraged me. It, here's what made me feel bad. When I looked at that, it said that it's only when a husband does those things, when they are thoughtful and respectful, that their prayers will not be hindered. Man, but if that's the case, I'm not that great of a husband. I don't. It says, I don't, I don't know about you, husband. Maybe, maybe you haven't figured out I don't. I don't consistently do the things that are in this passage. And so the way I read it when I first read it was, man, that means my prayers are never going to be heard. Because I'm never the, 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 the person that God's describing in verse 7. Rarely do I live up to the standards. Once a month, maybe? And so if the only way my prayers are going to be heard is when I am consistently being thoughtful and respectful, then I'm in huge trouble then. But here's why there's good news, guys, to the husbands here in the room. Here's why there's good news. Listen, the reason why there's good news is because the Bible tells us about another spouse. The Bible tells us about another husband. And unlike us, when he came down, he was thoughtful all the way through. He was respectful from beginning to end. But what's crazy about Scripture is that even though his prayers never deserve to be unhindered or blocked, in the moment where he needed the father the most, his prayers were unanswered. Why? Well, God chose not to answer the perfect husband's prayers so that one day he might be able to answer the imperfect husband's prayers. That's why. One of the things that I came across back when we did the Christmas series was in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, it says that a husband... It talks about Jesus coming down to earth. And it says that the reason why Jesus does it, I didn't talk about it back then because the word didn't really fit where I was going in the sermon. But, but it says that the zeal of the Lord will do this. In other words, the reason why Christmas happens is because of the zeal of the Lord. But the word there, zeal, has to do with a jealous lover's love, a husband coming after their wife. Jesus came after us. 
So the reason why we can go after them is because Jesus first came after us. Knowing that Jesus is the ultimate spouse of your wife shouldn't make you jealous. It should make you zealous. It should make you want to love her. It should make you want to pursue her. It should make you want to honor her. That's what it means. Once you understand that, then you realize you don't have to be her savior. You just, you just have to be her spouse. You don't have to be her hope. You just have to be her husband. Because Jesus is those things for her. So as we conclude this morning, here's what I want to say. Hopefully, through this series, you've seen that I've talked to both two groups of people, essentially. In this room, there's two groups of people. There are the non-marrieds and there's the marrieds. So the people who are non-married, here's what I'm going to say to you. Hopefully by now, you know what to look for in a spouse. I'm not talking about physical characteristics, color of skin, age demographic. Hopefully by now, you know what a spiritual spouse looks like. Here's the thing. There's two types of shoppers. There's impulsive shoppers and there's focused shoppers. I've been both. An impulsive shopper is a person who goes out to shop in order to make themselves feel better. That's how a lot of people date. But once you understand what God is expecting and what God is telling you to look for, now you can be a focused shopper. And doing that doesn't make you picky, it makes you holy. Okay? As you go out now, as you look for who God wants for you, here's the the thing. Remember what I said, soulmates are not biblical. If that's true, then here's what this means. It means that, if, that there's actually a huge pool of people for you to choose from. It's not, just, it's, not like, it's not like finding a needle in a haystack because soulmates are not a thing. True biblical marriage is not about being compatible. It's about being committed. I, this is going to sound crazy, but I wholeheartedly believe that there is probably men in the world who are more compatible to my wife than I am. But guess what? I'm the one I'm, she's committed to. Because if you go the compatible argument, then the moment they no longer feel compatible, you walk away. It's not about being compatible. It's about being committed. And to the married people in the room, hopefully by now you know what true gospel-centered marriages look like. So that as you go out and you try to live it out, you realize it's not you doing it, it's Jesus doing it through you. As the band comes up here in a second, I want you to know that the only way a good band works is if everyone plays their role. When a band, when someone tries to go hero and doesn't do the part they're supposed to do, the drums go uh, off or the, the, the bass does a solo or whatever and, and doesn't try to play the role, then all of a sudden the music doesn't sound right. That's what a marriage is like that doesn't have the roles correct. It doesn't sound right. Like you come around and you're like, it's supposed to be a gospel song, but it doesn't sound like it to me. Because when you play your roles, whether you're a husband or a wife, and the, the gospel's involved, man, it is a beautiful, beautiful song. I heard, I heard a verse, I'll uh, quote this, with, and I'll end with this. They said that, a pastor put it this way, when you get married, there's a picture of who you think your spouse should be. Everyone has a picture. The problem is God doesn't give you a picture, he gives you a person. And there's a gap between the picture and the person. So you have two options. You either tear up the picture and love the person, or you tear up the person and love the picture. The only way you'll ever be able to have the marriage that God is calling you to have, the only way you'll ever be able to model the gospel is through gospel meditation and gospel motivation. Amen? Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Listen, if you're sitting here today and you're a married couple and you're thinking, you know what, I think that we must take a step as a result of this series. Maybe your step is to come to our marriage conference that's happening here on Saturday, the Beyond Marriage Conference. Or maybe it's for you to go to a ministry program like Reengage, where you can go and find help for your marriage. But maybe you're sitting here as an individual and you're realizing, no, I actually need something deeper than that. I actually need to know who Jesus is. I don't actually know who he is. I can't model the gospel if I don't have a gospel relationship with the ultimate spouse. Maybe today, the step that you have to take is you have to believe in Jesus. I pray that today would be that day, that today would be the day that you place your faith in him and you say, I no longer want to live for myself. I no longer want to live for my spouse. I want to live for my 
heavenly spouse who gave himself up for me. If that's you, I would love for you to take a card that's in front of you. Fill it out. Let us know so that we can meet you, pray with you, and help you take this next step. And maybe for you, your step is to get baptized. Maybe you are called to be baptized. It's called to take a step. Maybe you know Jesus already, but you want your spouse to know. You want the world to know. You want the church to know. Like we looked at that baptism today. Maybe to you to, today, your step is to be baptized. Regardless of what your step is, I pray that you would take one, that you would not leave today without taking a step. Amen and amen.